Chapter 72, The Mountain Rumble Rico, too, stood at the mouth of the cave. Razum Unit 7134, are you in here? The only response was his own flat voice echoing back, but he sensed movement somewhere down the tunnel. So he switched on his headlights, raised his rifle, and marched inside. The Rico marched past animal bones and rock piles and wide cracks in the wall. His blocky head swiveled from side to side, scanning for any sign of Roz, but she was nowhere to be found. So he turned and marched back toward daylight, and then a deafening roar filled the cave. From the shadows grew a giant body. Mother Bear charged into the robot and smashed him against a wall. Then Nettle and Thorn jumped in, and together the family went to work. They rammed his legs, they slashed his chest, they muscled him to the ground. On his way down, Rico too squeezed the trigger. There was a flash of blazing light, and the walls began to crumble. Nettle grabbed her brother by the scruff and pulled him outside as an avalanche of rock thundered behind them. Mother Bear howled. The rifle exploded. Stones clanged against Rico, too. The avalanche slowed and settled as a cloud of dust billowed out from the cave. Mother? Nettle peered into the darkness. I'm here, said a weak voice. The young bears dashed inside and found their mother half buried. They pulled heavy stones from her body and dusted her off. I have broken bones, she rasped, but they'll heal. Where's this robot? Rico II's headlights switched back on. Stones tumbled as the robot staggered to his feet. His body was scratched and scraped. His head was badly dented. His left arm was completely useless, so thwip, it was tossed aside. Then the one-armed robot limped out of the cave and continued to hunt for Roz. Don't worry about me, Mother Bear growled to Nettle and Thorn. Kill the robot. With his heavy limp and his grinding gears, Rico, too, was easy to track. The young bears caught up with him as he entered the grove of pines. But they didn't attack, not yet. There was a better place to finish him off up ahead. So they hung back and followed him across the mountainside. The distant rumble of the waterfall grew louder with each passing minute, and then a slash of white appeared through the trees. Soon, the robot was standing beside the roiling, frothing river just below the falls. He was too badly damaged to leap over the falls or to wade through the rapids or to climb down the cliffs, but he had to continue his hunt for the target. So he started limping upriver in search of a safer crossing. There was a rustling, and the young bears exploded out from the trees. They threw their heavy shoulders against the robot's body, and he stumbled sideways onto the riverbank. Nettle reared up and wrestled the robot, twisting and shaking him with all of her strength. Rico, too, felt his feet slipping on the rocks. He felt his body tipping over, and then he plunged into the white water, and he brought Nettle with him. The current immediately swept Nettle toward the falls. She rolled through the rapids, crashed into one rock, and then desperately clambered onto another. Rico, too, stood straight up, and the river rushed around him. He took a step, slipped, and disappeared beneath the water. But then he was up again. Thorn ran to help his sister, but she was pointing up river and roaring, Use the logs! When the younger bear turned around, he saw what she meant. A jumble of broken logs were wedged between the rocks and the rapids, and a moment later, Thorn was on top of them. With water sloshing over his back, he forced a paw between the logs and pried the top one loose. It splashed into the river and wound its way down through the rapids, only to roll harmlessly past the robot. Then it dropped out of sight. The bear tried again. He popped another log into the river, and this one spun just in time to ram its full weight into the robot's chest. Rico, too, went sailing backward and sank beneath the surface. When he reappeared, the river was full of heavy wooden torpedoes. One log pounded the robot's shoulder, another slammed his face. More logs knocked him closer and closer to the falls. The current became too much for the injured robot, and it carried him away. He grasped for anything solid he could cling to, but the rocks were far too slippery, so he settled for a fistful of fur. 
Nettle had been hanging on the rock this whole time, but now that the robot was pulling her, she started losing her grip. She couldn't hang on much longer. Finally, she cried out, Sorry, Thorn, and she let go. Nettle and Rico, too, surged toward the rumbling falls. The bear felt the robot release his grip. She watched him glide over the edge. Then she closed her eyes and waited for the end to come. But it was not Nettle's time. Reader, what happened next is hard to believe. You see, the river didn't fall away beneath Nettle. It tightened around her. Hundreds of fish surrounded the bear. They pressed their faces into her fur. They thrashed their tails against the current, and they slowly pushed her away from the edge. Farther and farther they went, gradually moving upriver until Nettle's brother pulled her from the water. The bears collapsed onto the riverbank, and when they looked down, they saw hundreds of fish looking back up. Thank you, roared Nettle. I'll never eat fish again. The fish smiled and sank into the rapids. I thought you were dead, said Thorn, breathing hard. So did I, Nettle laughed. Looks like you're stuck with me a while longer, little brother. I'm not little. It felt good to joke, but the bears quickly turned serious. They were both bruised and bleeding, and their mother was in far worse condition. However, it would be all worthwhile if Rico, too, had finally been killed. The bears crept to the edge of the cliff, and there at the bottom of the waterfall, strewn across the wet rocks, was the shattered body of the dead robot. Chapter 73, The Chase Rico I was standing in the great meadow. He started up at the smoking hill of ash and then down at the stampede of footprints around it. There had been a large bonfire with hundreds of animals and one robot, but why? The Rico couldn't make sense of what he had been seeing. After thoroughly exploring the site, he continued through the meadow and into the forest. It was around that time that he lost communication with Rico III, then Rico II, and he knew that his partners had both been destroyed. Rico I would have to hunt down the target by himself. The hunter marched on, his blocky head swiveled from side to side, scanning for any sign of Roz. He was soon gazing across the glassy surface of a beaver pond. On the far side, a thread of smoke drifted up from another of those wooden domes. With his powerful legs, the robot launched himself up through the air, soaring in a high, graceful arc over the pond and down to the other side. His heavy feet slammed into the ground, leaving deep craters in the garden by the dome. He hunched over and looked inside. Fur and feathers and the dying coals of a fire, but the target wasn't in there. The Rico stood perfectly still and watched as a soft rain started dripping down through the tears of the forest. And then he sensed it. Up in the canopy was something that didn't belong. Roz had been spotted. The hunter watched his target drop from branch to branch down to the forest floor. Then she bounded away through the thickly tangled underbrush without stirring a leaf, without snapping a twig, and vanished into the green. However, Rico, one, had other means of tracking her. He could sense her electronic signal. The signal was gliding along the edge of the pond, but it was fading fast. A few more seconds and he would lose it entirely. Rico, one, burst into a sprint. The forest seemed to sway and quake under his stomping strides, and a minute later, the forest really did begin to move. Trees were toppling down onto the Rico. He fired his rifle, and two toppling trees turned to ash. But then a third swung down through the smoke and hammered his body into the ground. Rico one shoved the tree aside, pulled himself up, and continued the hunt. He didn't notice the beavers diving back into the pond. Rico one tore through the brambles and leaped over boulders and suddenly the ground was caving beneath him. Down he fell into a deep pit, crashing against the bottom and twisting his leg. The robot violently pounded his leg back into shape, then he launched himself up and out of the pit. He didn't notice the groundhogs watching from their tunnel. 
The hunter faced one trap after another. He was pelted with flaming pine cones and tripped by taut vines and crunched by tumbling rocks. The hunter now limped and rattled and was covered in scars, but he kept going. Roz galloped back and forth across the island again and again as she tried to lose Rico one. But no matter how fast she ran or how well she hid or how many animals helped, she couldn't escape the sound of the hunter's stomping footsteps. She had never run so hard for so long, and while her mechanical body was holding up, her wooden foot was not. After hours of relentless pounding, it finally gave out. She was galloping through the rocky forest by the sea cliffs when her foot splintered apart. As soon as Rico won found the fresh wooden splinters, he knew his target was in trouble. He stomped out from the trees on top of the cliff and scanned the coastline below. Geese were flying down through the drizzle. Otters were wriggling over the rocks. Seaweed and driftwood and broken robot parts were scattered about the shore. But the hunter also sensed a faint electronic signal. Roz was down there somewhere. The hunter's blocky hand clamped onto the cliff and then, thwip, it detached. The hand was connected to a strong cable that spooled out from the end of his arm. He gave the cable two quick tugs and then he stepped off the ledge. Rico one zipped down the cliffside, one arm releasing cable, the other clutching his rifle, and he slowed to a gentle stop just as he reached the ground. Then, high above the robot's hand, unclamped, and follow the cable all the way down until, whip, it snapped right back onto the end of his arm. Geese squawked and otters squeaked as Rico One marched through the robot gravesite. The place was littered with torsos and limbs and heads. They were all valuable parts, but he would collect them later. For now, his only concern was finding Roz. He found the electronic signal over a clump of seaweed. But where was his target? Was Rico One sensor malfunctioning? The robot tapped his head a few times, but the mysterious signal remained. He looked around for any other signs of her, and as he did, the clump of seaweed reached up and grasped his rifle. Chapter 74 The Click Four robot hands were clamped around the rifle. Rico One loomed above. Roz lay below, camouflaged in seaweed. For a moment, all was still, and then the hunter suddenly lurched and twisted as he tried to rip the rifle away from his target. But Roz held on. Seaweed fell from her body as she was lifted right off the ground. Her legs dangled in the air until she pounded a foot and a stump against the hunter's broad chest, leaned back, and pulled on the rifle with all of her strength. Waves crashed as the robots grappled for the weapon, but Roz was no match for Rico One. The hunter was too big and too brutal. Roz could feel her body being pulled apart, but she could also feel the rifle being pulled apart. A faint glow appeared between her hands. The glow grew brighter and brighter, and then a blinding explosion launched the robots in opposite directions. When the smoke cleared, shards of the rifle were Everywhere, Rico One's body was pocked with holes and one arm was charred and crippled. Roz's arms and legs had been blown completely off. She was now just a torso and a head. Inside her computer brain, our robot survival instinct instincts were blaring. Her battered body simply could not take any more damage. Clearly, Roz was not designed for combat, but the Rico was. He pulled himself to his feet and hobbled toward the target. Roz wanted to get up and run away, but without arms and legs, our robot couldn't move. She could only speak. Please do not deactivate me, she said. Rico, one, ignored her. His blocky hands reached past her face and touched the back of her head. Click. Chapter 75, The Last Rifle with the target deactivated, Rico One calmly moved on to the next phase of his mission. He limped through the gravesite and began collecting every single robot part. He splashed into the shallows and returned with a foot. He shook the sand from a cracked torso. He pulled a head out from a tide pool. Each part was then piled around Roz's lifeless body. 
Bright Bill watched in horror as his mother slowly disappeared under a pile of parts. Roz looked just like the dead robots, but she wasn't dead. She had simply been shut down. Don't do it, Bright Bill, the flat tried to stop their leader. It's too dangerous. But the goose was determined to bring his poor mother back to life. Bright Bill crouched low to the ground and slowly moved toward the pile of robots. And when Rico One limped away to collect other parts, Bright Bill sprinted over the rocks, pushed past arms and legs, and squeezed into the pile. Click. A muffled voice echoed across the shore. Hello, I am Rosam Unit 7134, but you may call me Roz. Bright Bill hugged his mother's face as her computer brain rebooted. Mama, wake up! What happened? She said finally. Where is the Rico? He's coming this way! What were you thinking, Bright Bill? You must leave before he kills us both. I was scared, Mama, cried the goose. I don't know what to do. Heavy footsteps stomped toward them. Robot parts were knocked aside, and then Rico One looked down with his glowing eyes. Bright Bill tried to squirm away, but thick fingers locked around him like a cage. Mama, help! cried Bright Bill as he was pulled up from the pile. Please do not hurt my son, begged Roz. He is harmless. Rico One paid no attention to Roz. He just held up the goose in his giant hand, ready to crush the life out of him. Mist swirled in the breeze. Waves sloshed against the rock. Seagulls circled. No, not seagulls, vultures. And one of them clutched something silver in his talons. The vultures spiraled down, and Rico's three rifle clattered onto the shore. Geese and otters quickly surrounded the rifle. They squawked and squeaked and fumbled with the weapon, trying to aim the clunky thing. The hunter was confused. How had those animals gotten a rifle, and could they possibly know how to fire it? They did know. The geese had seen a trigger press before. A beam of light briefly flashed through the gloom. At first it seemed as if nothing had happened, but a moment later Rico's chest began glowing a brilliant orange and then it was melting and oozing down his front and soon there was a wide gaping hole in the middle of his torso his hand suddenly unclenched and bright bill fluttered away seawater sprayed over the grave site and steam hissed up from the rico scorching hot guts he shook and twitched and collapsed beside Roz. Rico One turned his face to Roz and spoke in a quiet, garbled voice. More Ricos will come for you. And if you d d destroy them, still more will come. The makers will not rest until all missing robots have been retrieved. When? When will they come? said Roz. How long do we have? You can still be fixed, Roz. Go to the airship. Bring all of the robot parts with you. The ship knows what to do. His voice went silent. His eyes went dark. Rico One was dead. Chapter 76, The Broken Robot Geese and otters were bustling all around Roz. They were pulling arms and legs out from the robot pile and pressing them against her body. They were hoping to hear thwip sounds that the robot's limbs would snap right into place and Roz would turn into her old self and life on the island would go back to normal. But nothing happened. No matter what they did, the limbs wouldn't attach. Our robot's body was too badly damaged. I'm sorry, Ma, said Bright Bill, his voice trembling. I thought this would work. It is okay, son, said Roz calmly. I am lucky. I can still think and speak. The animals tried to smile at their poor friends, but they couldn't hide their sadness. Roz was a mangled wreck. 
and there was nothing they could do to fix her. The robot wanted to be strong for her son and her friends. She wanted to ease their worried minds and tell them everything would be fine. But Roz knew that everything would not be fine. She looked down at her broken body. Then she looked up at the geese and the otters and said, I will need some help getting home. Chapter 77, The Meeting the strong, nimble creatures carried Roz up the sea cliffs and across the island. They carefully propped her up inside the nest. They built a fire, and then they left the robot with her son. Roz and Brightbill sat there staring at the flames until the goose finally said, Do you need anything, Ma? I could really use some new arms and legs. The robot chuckled at her own bad joke. That isn't funny, cried the goose. My mother is broken and I don't know what to do about it. I am sorry for joking, Roz adjusted her voice to a more serious tone. I know you want to fix me, but there is nothing anyone can do. At these words, her son looked away. Right, Bill? I am afraid we have some difficult decisions to make. I think you should arrange a meeting of our closest friends. We could use their advice. The goose disappeared out the door, and soon Roz's oldest and wisest friends were on their way. Loudwing was the first to arrive. She limped into the lodge on her injured foot and sat close to her robot friend. Mr. Beaver appeared next, followed by Fink and Swooper. Then Tawny curled up on the floor. Mother Bear was too badly hurt to make the journey, so Nettle came in her place. She sat in the garden with her enormous head jutting in through the doorway. Bright Bill returned with Chit Chat, who was nursing her burned tail. The last one to crawl in was Crag, the old turtle. Once everyone was there, the meeting began. The group talked all through the night. They discussed the Ricos. They discussed what to do about Roz. They discussed how to keep the island safe. There were stark differences of opinion and tempers flared, but by daybreak the group had agreed to a plan of action. The morning, the dawn truce, didn't take place in the great meadow. Instead, it took place in a small meadow by the foot of the mountains in front of the airship. Weary animals quietly hobbled into the clearing. The only sound came from a gurgling brook that wound through the gathering and right past our robot. Roz sat in the wet grass. She was leaned against a rock. She looked so sad and frail. However, she still had her thoughts and her words, and for the moment, that was all she needed. Good morning, animals of the island, Roz's voice filled the meadow. I must look strange to you all beaten up like this, but I hope I sound like your old friend. Heads, hundreds of heads, nodded. You fought bravely yesterday. You risked your lives defending me, and I am eternally grateful. But many of our friends were wounded. Some may not recover, and there is worse news. Before the last Rico died, he told me that more of his kind will come to our island. They might already be on the move, and even if we defeat them, still more will come. My maker will not rest until all of their property has been retrieved. They want the dead robots. They want the broken parts. They want me. The crowd was silent. But I care about this island far too much to put any more lives in danger. So, my friends, I must leave. Voices cried out. Don't go, Roz. Next time we'll be prepared. We risked our lives so you could stay. I hear you, the robot's voice cut through the dim. But look at me. My body is ruined. And the Rico said, the only ones who can help me are my makers. What if he lied, howled a voice. You can't trust those monsters. You are right, said Roz. He might have been lying. There may be no hope for me, but that is the chance I have to take. Animals, you have taught me to be wild. I want to be wild again, and so I must try to get the repairs I need. It is for the good of me and the island that I return to my makers. The calm settled over the crowd. They knew Roz was right. Chapter 78, The Farewell Our robot had an army of animals at her command, and she asked them to bring every robot part and rifle back to the airship. Absolutely everything had to go. 
It was the only way to be sure that the Ricos would never come back. The island animals had no trouble locating the remains of the dead robots. Retrieving those remains took a bit more effort, but they were up to the challenge. Teams of clever creatures returned with robot parts of different shapes and sizes. Smashed heads and broken rifles and twisted tubes and heavy bodies were all loaded into the ship until the entire island had been cleared. Even the tiniest scraps were collected. It's amazing what an army of animals can do. A light mist was falling when they finally heaved Roz through the ship's doorway. Her head slowly turned around to face the crowd of geese and beavers and owls and insects and foxes and raccoons and vultures and moose and bears and opossums and fish and deer and otters and turtles and woodpeckers and squirrels and frogs and hares and on and on. Every animal on the island had come to give the robot a proper send-off. Goodbye, you wild animals, Roz's voice echoed through the gray mist. The wild animals smiled, and then a few of them started to roar. Then more started to screech, and then more started howling and chirping and grunting. Soon, every creature was hollering goodbye to Roz. The chorus of wild voices grew louder and louder, shaking the robot's body, rattling the ship, booming across the island and up into the clouds, and then their voices gradually died down to silence. Bright Bill fluttered up to his mother's shoulder. You understand why I must leave, said the robot. I understand, sniffed the goose. More Ricos could be headed here right now. I just do not know. There is so much I do not know. I think it is time I get some answers. Will I ever see you again? Said Bright Bill, wiping his eyes. You are my son, and this is my home, said Roz. I will do everything in my power to return. Bright Bill hugged his mother's worn face. I love you, Mama. I love you, son. The goose fluttered back to his flock. The robot took one last look at her home. The door hummed closed. Chapter 79, The Departure The airship's engines automatically fired up. Then the ship slowly floated above the island, turned to the south, and disappeared into the clouds. Chapter 80, The Sky Our story ends in the sky, where a robot was being whisked away from the only home she had ever known. As Roz sat in the airship, broken and alone, and speeding toward a mysterious future, she looked back at her miraculous past. Reader, it must seem impossible that a robot could have changed so much. Maybe the Ricos were right. Maybe Roz really was defective, and some glitch in her programming had caused her to accidentally become a wild robot. Or maybe Roz was designed to think and learn and change. She had simply done those things better than anyone could have imagined. However it happened, Roz felt lucky to have lived such an amazing life, and every moment had been recorded in her computer brain. Even her earliest memories were perfectly clear. She could still see the sun shining through the gash in her crate. She could still hear the waves crashing against the shore. She could still smell the salt water and the pine trees. Would she ever see and hear and smell those things again? Would she ever climb a mountain or build a lodge or play with a goose? Not just a goose, a sun. Bright Bill had been Roz's son from the moment she picked up his egg. She had saved him from certain death, and then he had saved her. He was the reason Roz had lived so well for so long. And if she wanted to continue living, if she wanted to be wild again, she needed to be with her family and her friends on the island. So, as Roz raced through the sky, she began computing a plan. She would get the repairs she needed. She would escape from her new life. She would find her way back home. <laughs>